Um, my name is Joe Conway. I work for Crunchy Data. Uh, I've been with the Postgres community for a lot of years. I started participating in, in like 1998, 99. Got really active in the early 2000s, and I'm a committer now. Have been since 2003. So what I'm going to do is talk about how you can do a multi-level security database. I'll start out with kind of, and I, I learned this, I've given this talk a couple of times, and the first time I just dove right into the technical details and people's eyes glazed over and it wasn't good. So I'm gonna start out with kind of a 50,000 foot, this is what I'm talking about sort of thing, and I'm gonna try and do a quick demo. And then I'm gonna go into a bit of detail on the individual components or the main components that we use to do this and a little bit of high level about the configuration and setup. That part alone could be a half day tutorial easily. Um, and then finally at the end, I'll show it to you in action in terms of selects and inserts and updates and what they look like as well as some measured performance results that I did. So first of all, what is multi-level security? The idea is that you've got and, and specifically here, I'm using SE Linux. So SE Linux defines levels, security levels, as these S and then a number. They typically go from S0 through S15. And the idea is that if you, if you have access at S5, you should be able to read below. So that someone who's got access at this level should be able to read anything at the green level or the yellow level. In addition to that, with MLS, there's also this notion of categories. So categories are a way of subdividing the information. It's the, you know, if you're talking military terms, it would be sort of need to know. So even if I have a sensitivity level five, some data that's associated with a C4 project, if I don't have C4, I shouldn't get to see that. That's kind of, at a real high level, what we're trying to do. So to try and make it a little bit more real for you, your companies, your organization, so you can think of this as being access groups. You know, so I've got management at the top who should be able to see everything. The employees should be able to see probably most stuff, but maybe not some financial data or something that management has access to. And then you have external consumers of your data, potentially the public, partners, customers, and so on, right? And if you extend this with the categories, and these categories now each become a different project that your company or your organization is involved with. So when you look at this cell down here, it's both external level and it's not associated with a specific project. So that would be data that's accessible to the public, to anyone, right? Whereas in this cell here under P2, this might be your customers or your partners. So these are people external to your organization. They should be able to see something associated with that particular project, whereas the general public can't. You step up a level, the employees on P2 project might be your scrum team. So they have access to more information specifically about that project. And then finally, the product owner for that project ultimately has all the information available to them, at least associated with that particular project. Does that, that all make sense? So some of this you may not understand as I'm going through it right now, but I'm hoping it'll set you up to understand what I'm, what I'm describing things later a little better. So the way this thing works, um, you've got essentially a client. And let's say in this case I've got a client that's got access to all three levels, and I've got a Postgres server that's also got access to all three levels. How are we gonna decide what level the person gets to actually see? So the first thing that happens is, on the client side, you have to make some kind of a selection as to what level you're interested in. The way we've implemented this, at least so far, is that that level that you have access to is a combination of who you're logging in as, as well as what network you're coming in over. And that's, I think, typical, at least for some of our government-related customers. Um, what you can do with SE Linux is you can label a specific network with a specific level of access and then try and restrict all data on that 
network to that level. So once you've picked a specific subnet, or maybe more usefully, if you've got IPsec set up, you can have IPsec project the label that you had on the client to the server, basically. So when you finally connect with PSQL or your application or whatever it is you're connecting with, that combination of the network you came in over and who you logged in as is what's going to determine what level of access you're going to get. So now let me, it's always risky to do a live demo, but I'm going to try and do it anyway. Um, just to describe what I did here is I downloaded data from um, OpenStreetMap. I actually did this a few weeks ago at Phosphor G, so it, for them it was a, a nice example. Um, that data, you get these four tables, planet, OSM, line, point, polygon, and roads. Each one of those is basically a, a table with a bunch of columns that describe attributes about some geographical object, and then one column with a geometry. So that'll either be a point, or it'll be a line, or it'll be a road, or it'll be a polygon, right? And in, in GIS systems, this is typically the way they represent separate layers. So all the lines are in one layer on a map, and all of the points are on another layer on the map. And when they lay it, when they show you the map, they just add the layers, right? So additionally, what I did, you can see this thing has a lot of columns, but it has this geometry column called way. What I did was I added this security label column, and again, you'll understand this a little bit more as I go through the slides why, but I added the security la label column and I added these policies. And so now, and this thing is running in a, in a virtual machine in VirtualBox on my laptop. So now on my laptop, on the host, if I'm logged in as a user that has access to all four of those la layers, oh, and I, I neglected to mention that for each of those layers, each of those tables where I added the security column, I essentially labeled each, all the rows in the entire layer at the same security level, but each of the four layers is at a different security level. So it it's, makes it easier to show you that, all right, this particular individual that's logged in here is user four, and you can see if I start turning these things off that feature, features go away, he's got access, this guy has access to all four of these layers, this person. But if I log into the exact same server as a different user, and this user only has access at the lowest level, you'll see that you don't get all those other layers, you just get the point layer. And I can prove that by unchecking that, now you can see there's no layers. It's basically the only thing this individual has access to is that point layer. So kind of, this is that, the, at the 50,000 foot level, what is it we're trying to accomplish? Any questions about that? So, you know, one of the questions is why would you want to do this? Um, in certain very high security environments, what they end up doing in order to separate the data and be really sure that it's separated is they end up duplicating all the computer systems. They have, literally have a client system that's at the lowest level that connects to a server that's at the lowest level, and another client machine that connects to a server that's at the highest level, but if you want to jump from looking at the data at the lowest level to looking at data at the highest level, you literally have to get up and move to a different machine to do it. So there's obviously a lot of duplication of hardware, which is expensive. If you're trying to do any kind of reporting or analysis that needs to cross these layers, that's very, very difficult to do, if, if at all possible. Um, you could you probably have data that needs to be shown at all the different levels, and therefore you'd have to duplicate it. You could also filter this data through your application, but being database people, we like to give that responsibility to the database. And the other thing is this uh, method is something called um, mandatory access control versus discretionary. So I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute, but what it means is the person who owns the table isn't necessarily getting to decide who gets to see it. There's a security administrator who gets to decide who, who can see it. 
And by the way, the RLS, which is one of the new features in Postgres 9.5, uh, performs pretty well, at least in the testing I've done so far. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into the individual components. How many people here have played with RLS at all or even familiar with it? Anyone? A little bit? So RLS was brand new in 9.5. Uh, it was primarily written by a colleague of mine, Stephen Frost. Um, it's something that you enable on a per table basis. And it's enforced with policies. The policies that you write, and I, I showed you a, a brief glimpse at one earlier and I'll show you some more later. But the policies that you write have two clauses associated with them that, that control how they work. One of them is a using expression. That works on the, the old row. And the other part is the with check expression, which works on the new row. And effectively, what the using expression is doing is it's filtering transparently what you get to see, whereas the with check is preventing you from doing something you shouldn't be able to do. It'll throw an error if you try and do something you can't do. So in a, in a nutshell, that's RLS. Now, I'm gonna show you an example to help you understand RLS a little better. This actually, this example has nothing to do with MLS. This is pure RLS, but this is kind of the classic use case for, for RLS. So I create a user, two users, Bob and Alice, and then I'm gonna create this table that has a, includes a column called app user. And then I'm gonna insert two rows in there and I'm gonna put Bob's name and app user in one row and Alice's name and app user in the other row. Then I need to enable row level security on the table and create a policy that says basically using app user equals current user. So now, when Bob is logged in, Bob should only see the rows that are marked Bob, and then when Alice is logged in, she should only see the rows that are marked Alice. Now I still need to grant select on this table to public, otherwise they won't be able to see anything. So when I'm logged in as super user, so I'm still logged in as Postgres here, and when I select from that table, I actually see both rows. So the super user doesn't get RLS applied. But when I change my session authorization to Bob, you can see Bob only sees Bob's row, and when you change to Alice, Alice only sees Alice's row. Any question about that? I think there's a lot of really interesting use cases for RLS, by the way, besides this one. How many people here are familiar with use SE Linux? Not very much. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, most people, their first inclination is to turn it off. Um, and there's a lot of good reasons you shouldn't do that, actually. And um, the community around SE Linux has gone a long way to trying to make it more usable. The, actually, if you run RHEL 7, RHEL 7 comes with SE Linux running in enforcing mode by default. But it's running in a mode that um, it's in this targeted policy. So what the targeted policy means is there's certain services that are targeted for enforcement and everything else is kind of wide open. That's one of the reasons why it doesn't get in the way as much with people today as it did before because that targeted policy is actually pretty effective. Yeah, you, you hit it like if you try and change where Apache looks for its files, that kind of thing. But in any case, so SE Linux is a mandatory access control system, and that's as compared to a discretionary access control. Discretionary access control is, is what you're used to seeing. On, uh, you know, on a Linux system, you create a file and you can grant access to that file to, other, to the world, right? Uh, in a database, if you create a table, you can grant access to that table to other people. Um, mandatory access control means the system is enforcing a policy and there's some kind of a security administrator who's defining the policies. So the person creating the object doesn't get the option to decide who gets to see it. It's enforced in the kernel and 
it's, as I said, it's managed via this reference policy, and targeted policy is the default on RHEL 7, but there is available this MLS policy, and once you install and switch over to the MLS policy, now your entire system is constrained, including the root user. So they're, as root, on a fully constrained MLS system, there are things that you cannot do unless you've got access, been given access to do them and you make the proper switches within SE Linux. Now in order to make our solution work, we've also had to customize this reference policy with um, policy modules that we wrote ourselves. Our plan is to try and contribute those back to upstream to SE Linux. We've actually gotten a patch, at least one critical patch already accepted um, over time, we plan to get a lot of the rest of the stuff that we've done around this work submitted. Um, and on this slide, when you go look, look at these slides online, if you do, I've included a link. Um, there's a guy at Red Hat who's kind of their guru of um, SE Linux named Dan Walsh, and he created this thing, this SE Linux coloring book. It, it sounds kind of silly. They actually print these things out. I've been to events where they've got printed out coloring books that you can bring home to your kids. But um, what it does is it tries to, in a very simple way, explain what SE Linux is and how it works so that people won't be so inclined to immediately go turn it off. So I recommend if you're interested in this topic at all that you go look at that. MLS is based on something called the Bell LaPagula model which was developed, I think, in the early 70s. Um, you know, it's, you could spend a lot of time reading on it and reading about how it's supposed to work, but what it kind of boils down to is what I described earlier, which is I should be able to read down, so I should be able to see anything at the level that I've been granted and below. And in, in the pure Bell LaPagula, you're supposed to be able to write up, which means theoretically, even though I have only the lowest level of access, I should be able to write something at a much higher level. In, in Red Hat, they've actually constrained that to be write equals, which means whenever you create something, it's gonna get created with a, a context of whatever level you're logged in as currently. So in terms of enforcing security, SE Linux uses this security context all over the place. It's broken down into these segments. There's a user, basically an SE Linux user, an SE Linux role, a domain, and then what we've been talking about so far is the sensitivity in the category. And basically what happens at the OS level is if you log in, if I log into my system as Jay Conway, there's a mapping for my Linux user, Jay Conway, to some SE Linux user. And that mapping is going to determine what roles I'm allowed, SC Linux roles I'm allowed to have. And the roles I'm allowed to have is going to determine what domains I can have. And really, in terms of enforcement, there's kind of two separate types of things that are done. This domain is used for something called type enforcement, which is before you even decide whether you should have access to something based on its level, should you even be allowed to do this type of access on this type of object? That's what type enforcement does. So that gets applied, and then the level, the sensitivity in the category, is what's going to kick in in terms of multi-level security to determine whether, furthermore, whether I get access to something. And these are some examples of what, what these contexts might look like. This one at the top here is an example of a, a Postgres user context. So this is the logged in user, DBS6, U, and it's, this is not required, but it's kind of customary in SE Linux that the user is usually something underscore U, the role is something underscore R, and the type is something underscore T. So this is DBS6, U, DB client R, DB client T, and S0 meaning lowest level of access. This is an example of what a context might look like for an object or a row in one of these tables. So system U, object R, SE, PG SQL table T, and then this is defining actually a range of levels. So this particular object, which probably is a table, 
can contain data that includes all levels in all categories. Now, when SE Linux makes a security access decision, deciding whether or not you can see or do whatever it is you're trying to do, it takes into account the subject context, which in our case here is going to be the logged in Postgres user. And then it also has an object context. That's the thing that you're trying to manipulate in some way. And then there's also a permission. What are you trying to do with that object? Are you trying to select it? Are you trying to delete it? Are you trying to insert it? Are you trying to relabel it? And then it looks, as I said before, the first thing it's going to look at is based on the subject and the object, or the subject and the target, and what I'm trying to do, should I even allow this thing to happen? That's the type enforcement. You can use that for kind of a role-based ac uh, access control. And then it's going to do MLS enforcement. If it's going to, the, the subject, which is the logged in user, has a sensitivity that must dominate the object. So if I'm logged in as a user with S5, that dominates an S3. So if the row I'm trying to look at is at S3, I'm logged in as S5, I should be able to see it. Whereas the category must be included. There's no notion of hierarchy. In, in sensitivities, there's a hierarchy. If you've got a higher sensitivity, you can see the lower stuff. In categories, there's no hierarchy. They have to actually match. So if I have S5, C1 dot C5, which just means C1 through C5, it does not include S3, C42. So this would get rejected. Now the other main component that we're using here is SEPG SQL, which has been in Contrib and Postgres since I think 9.1. Um, but in order to uh, make it work with RLS, we needed to do some modifications. And again, so far, we have those modifications in held internally. Our intent is to contribute them back to the extent that the community is desirable of them. Um, we'll hopefully get them into uh, 10 in the fall, either in the first or the second commit fest. In a nutshell, Postgres supports the, uh, the notion of a security label through a security label command. But by itself, security label doesn't do anything. It's really just a place to store a label or a tag that has to do with some object on the system. And it depends on what's called a label provider. And in this case, SEPG SQL is the label provider that works with SE Linux to use these labels. So we've had to customize SE Linux um, in order to make this work. First of all, we had to provide this mapping of a database user to an SE Linux user. That wasn't part of it, but we felt like that was needed. When you log in, we need to know, based on who you are when you log in, what SE Linux permissions you should have. We also need to do a, a context transition, which basically means, as I mentioned earlier, the, the label that, this, that, that you get when you log into Postgres is not only based on the SE Linux user that you're mapped to, it's also based on the network that you came in over. And so we need to do that calculation and then set your, your context appropriately. And then there's these two functions. I mean, there's other things that we've added, but these are the, uh, these are the primary things that, that make this work. We've got this check row label function and a create row label function. What those are going to do is based on the row that you're trying to access, do the calculation. Check row label is going to do the calculation based on your subject context and the rows label, which is the object context, and what you're trying to do. And it's going to decide whether you get to see that row or insert that row or whatever. Create row label is going to create a new label as you're trying to create new data. So in check row label, the object context is going to be the argument that I pass in, which is the row security label. The subject context is this calculated value based on the client and the network. And then the permission type, which is this optional second argument, is what you're trying to do. So it defaults to select if you don't use it. 
but you can also specify that this is a, an insert or update or delete or I'm doing a relabel. And then SE Linux will decide whether or not to return a true or a false, because that's the way real level security works. Basically, the expression in the using clause of a real level security policy has to return true or false. If it's true, you get to see the row. In the case where we're using this, um, I'm logged in here as a S5 user. And if I use this function with, with this security label, so this is simulating what it would see if it were looking at a row. And this row is labeled at S0 and I'm logged in as S5, then that function will return true, which means I'll be able to see that row. Whereas if that was labeled as six, which is above my level, it'll return false. Now, on the other hand, if I'm trying to do a delete, so this is the two argument version of this thing, so I'm specifying that I'm doing a delete here, and I'm still logged in as S5. So if I try and delete an S0, when I'm at S5, remember when I'm changing data, it's got to be right equals. It's going to tell me you can't do that. And I'm specifically logged in as S5 C1. And again, if I try and delete an S5 without a C1, it's also going to reject that. But if I try and delete an S5 C1, which is matching what I'm logged in as, it'll let me do it. In terms of create row label, this is just kind of a helper function to grab the, the label out of the table for me. So this, this table label, this is the label of the table, kind of like what I showed you earlier. So this table is able to take all levels and all categories. My subject, or what I'm logged in at, is this D5 with an S5 C1. And so the calculated value, this is the value of the label that would go into the table if I was doing an insert, is sort of derived from the two of these things. It's get, it gets the user from the subject, but it gets the role and the type from the table. And then again, it, it gets the level that's being inserted from the subject. So in terms of Configuration setup. Um, we've done this with Reddit RHEL 7. We've also worked with RHEL 6, so this should work on RHEL 6 as well. Um, there's some changes that you have to make to what we currently have for that to work. You do need to install the additional, some additional SE Linux packages. And as I mentioned earlier, your network interfaces have to be configured so that they put a label on the connections when, they, when they're made. So you can do that either through something called NetLabel, which will work with on a per connection basis. So you can ha say that subnet one gets a label at this level and subnet two gets a label at some other level. Or you can use a labeled IPsec, which will actually propagate the label at the client all the way to the server. You need to set up routes if you've got multiple subnets, obviously. Um, you also need to tweak SSH-D um, on, uh, on a RHEL 7 system, which is system D, you need to switch from sshd.service to sshd.socket, and that's to allow NetLabel actually to do its work. And then finally, on a, on a standard RHEL system, the port for Postgres is blocked, so you need to unblock it if you want to be able to connect across a network. In terms of SE Linux configuration, you need to install custom policy modules that I discussed earlier. You'll need to create the specific SE Linux users that you want to map to. You have to build and configure and install SEPG SQL, the modified version, and you have to provide that mapping from the logged in users to the SE Linux users. Now this is a bit of an aside, but I mentioned the um, role-based access control or the type enforcement. And, you know, when you're, if you're 
doing multi-level security in your database, you probably care a lot about security in a whole bunch of ways, right? So one of the things that it's kind of nice about SCPG SQL and role-based access control is that you can also sort of lock down other things that can be done. So we actually created these SE Linux roles. These are some of our custom policy. And we've defined them in such a way so that we can have like a DB admin role, which is a purely OS role, which owns the cluster. But that's a different role than the logged in super user which means we can ensure that even if you're logged in as the Postgres super user and you get out to the command line, since it's a different user that owns all the files, SE Linux is going to prevent you from doing things that you might otherwise be able to do as super user. We've also defined the security user that specifically owns like pghbaconf and postgresql.conf which again means even the admin of the cluster cannot change those two files. And then we've provided kind of normal users, the staff user, which is basically the user you would log in as to log in normally before you would escalate yourself to super user. The client user is doing standard CRUD operations and then a guest user, which is read only. But some of the other things we were able to do with this is we can prevent for instance, the super user from creating arbitrary functions. We can prevent the super user from inserting rows directly into a catalog table. Now, at times you may need to be able to do that, but at those times, the security administrator can say, all right, I'm going to allow this. Super user can go do his thing with someone watching over the shoulder, and then you can turn it back off. So the, the question is, is would you use a security definer function to sort of enable that and make that easier? And, and the, the answer is, in a way, yes. You can, you can create a security definer function. SE Linux and SE PG SQL actually defines kind of the equivalent of a security definer function in the SE Linux world. So you can have a function that will run from an SE Linux standpoint as the security user and grant that specific function to the super user, for instance. So there, there's a lot more that we can do here. We're just basically scratching the surface on, on things that could be done. So then you need to install the uh, SEPG SQL. Because of the way it works, it hooks in very early in the startup, so you actually need to install this thing in um, single user mode. Um, which is standard for SEPG SQL. And in the documentation online, there's basically this formula. Uh, there's a formula for doing that. Actually, I'm not showing it here. There's some, uh, some custom um, parameters that we've developed that need to be set. And then finally, you've seen a little bit of this, but this is the way we're going to define our table. We have to have a security label column that's text, and we're going to default it to this create row label function and feed into it the name of the table because that's the way that function works. It's going to derive the label based on the name of the table. We've got to grant permissions, and in my examples here, there's four users, users one through four. I'm going to grant them access to the table. I'm going to enable row level security on the table. And then I'm going to create these four policies. So the policies, there isn't just one policy on a table with RLS. You can create a separate policy for each you know, select, insert, update, and delete. And you notice that on select, I only have a using clause because there is no new row in a select. On insert, there's no old row, so you only have the with check. On an update, you have both using and with check because there's an old row and a new row. And on delete, there's only an old, old row. So effectively, this means I can only delete a row that I'm allowed to see, right? Because if I try and delete something that I can't see, it looks like it doesn't exist. So now in terms of what this actually looks like in practice, the first thing 
I've kind of glossed over a little bit, but if, um, if I try and connect, I'm a, if I have a user that's mapped to an SE Linux user that's at S0, which is the lowest level, and I try and connect on that S4 subnet, which is supposed to have higher level traffic, I'm going to get an error. Now, every time I look at this as I give this talk, I think to myself, we really need to improve that error message, but the fact is, you won't be allowed to log in. If I'm an S0 user on an S0 subnet, I will be able to log in. And I'll get that S0 level. If I'm an S6 user and I'm logging in on that S0 subnet, so even though I've got access to the S6 level, I'm logging in as S0 on the S0 subnet, you'll note that even though my context here shows that I'm the S6 user, my level is at S0. Any questions on that? Okay, so I have a little bit less than 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna speed up a little bit because I wanna be able to show you the performance results. Um, if I do a select as an S0 user on an S0 subnet, you'll note that I only see the row that's at S0. Again, if I'm logged in as S6 on an S0 subnet, I still only see that S0 level row. Makes, should make sense at this point, I think. And if I log in as the S6 user on an S6 subnet, now all of a sudden I'm seeing rows across all the levels. If I do an insert as an S0 user on the S0 subnet, my row gets labeled with S0. If I do an insert as the S6 user on the S0 subnet, my row is still labeled as S0. Even though it's nominally owned by that S6 user. And then if I do an insert at S6 user on the S6 subnet, I get an S6 row. With updates, if I'm doing an S0 user on an S0 subnet and I'm trying to modify an S0 row, I'm able to update it. And similarly, if I do an S6 user on the S0 subnet and I try and update an S0 row, I'm able to do it. And if I try and modify an S6 row, log in as the S6 user on the S6 subnet, I'm also able to do it. But if I try and as the S6 user on the S6 subnet, now I can see that S0 row, I showed you that a few slides ago, but if I try and alter that row logged in this way, I'm gonna get a security violation. Okay, so in terms of performance testing, clearly there's more we could do here, but I wanted to do some basic testing at least. So what I did was I created three separate tables that were defined pretty much exactly like the one I showed you a few slides ago for this demo data. T1 is gonna be full RLS MLS table. R1 is going to be the same table definition but there's no, ML, no MLS applied to it. It's just pure expressions. Now I'm using the exact same labels in order to make, make the results comparable but I'm just doing simple expressions to check the labels essentially. And then table U1, which is not even using RLS. It's got the column there, but I'm not using RLS at all. I insert 10 million rows into each table. Uh, each table has four different levels, S0, S4, S5, S6, and they each comprise one quarter of the table. And I'm gonna time doing inserts, I'm gonna time doing a selective one row, and I'm gonna time doing selective 50,000 rows. So in terms of the insert performance, now I've repeated this a few times and on an, across at least two different computers, one of them being a dedicated desktop system that I've got at home, nothing spectacular. Um, this latest set, I updated my slides just last week with test running on my laptop, uh, which has got an SSD, but it's also running on a VM instead of on raw hardware. Interestingly, it was way faster than the, the dedicated hardware. But um, the other thing was I had compiled the other one using uh, CS certs when I compiled Postgres, so I suspect a lot of the timing difference was from that. 
But in any case, when I do the insert into the MLS case, the total insert time is about 22 seconds. When I do it with the RLS case, the total insert time is about 20 seconds. And then, you know, like I said, I did this several times, and it, for some reason, not even using RLS, it, this one came out a little longer. So not even using RLS, it was a little, took a little longer. Doesn't make any sense, it probably just represents variability on the machine. I mean, I wasn't doing anything else on the machine at the time, but obviously the machine was doing something. I think the takeaway from that is, this performs pretty darn well, right? In terms of the select performance for one row, with MLS, it took about um, 0.8 microseconds or milliseconds. With RLS, it took about 0.7. And without RLS at all, it took about point, almost 0.6. So there was a little bit more of a hit there, but you know, on a table with 10 million rows, given what you're getting out of MLS, it's actually, I think, pretty reasonable. With 50,000 rows, the timings were 81 milliseconds, and this is an average over 10 runs, uh, 81 milliseconds for the MLS case, 46 for the RLS case, and actually, 55 seconds, and this one I've repeated a bunch of times, and I consistently get RLS coming out faster than not using RLS in this case, and I can only assume that this modulus operator is somehow more expensive than the expression evaluation or RLS. But again, you can see the results are, are pretty comparable, and given what you're getting from an MLS system, I think it's pretty reasonable. And that's all I have, and I think I've got about Three, four minutes for questions. Go ahead. Uh, we have tested it out on AWS a bit. We haven't gone very extensively on that yet, but we do intend to. That's one method. So the question was, is, do you need to have the application push the user down to the database for all of this to work. And, I, you know, the answer is, is that there's oh, probably more ways than I've even thought about so far that you could do this. The way we've done it so far would require that, so your application would have to be aware of the fact that it needs to connect differently than it has in the past. Now, there are people, people that I work with that would argue that you should be doing that anyway. That the fact that, you know, just the fact that most of the applications I've seen in the years I've been doing this, they tend to use a single database user to represent all of their application users. That's not necessarily a really good practice, and so you really should be using different users. There are other ways you could do it. You could have your application aware that if user A logs in, I need to use subnet one, and if user B logs in, I need to use subnet two. But in an ideal sense, uh, especially if you start thinking about people in the field with maybe a laptop and running IPsec, their security context is actually set at the beginning of their connection and carried over IPsec, and ideally you would like to detect that and propagate that in, down to the database as well. I think I'm, oh, go ahead. Yes, you're not supposed to write at a level other than what you're logged in at. And so I guess the, the feeling is, and, and this is just standard the way MLS works on SE Linux, at least as defined by Red Hat. And um, you know, I guess the idea is that if, if you're 
an S6 user and you have access to data at that level, you don't want to accidentally write it in a way that it could leak that information. Anything else? I think I'm pretty much out of time. Okay, thank you. <laughs>